Hello and welcome to the Iowa State University Extension and Outreach Master Gardener webcast series. My name is Susan DeBleek and I'm the Assistant Coordinator for the Iowa Master Gardener program and I wanted to introduce you to the webcast today. Today we're going to be talking about landscaping for wildlife. This is part of a three-part series to help Master Gardener volunteer projects go to the next level. We've had some fantastic speakers and I'm really excited to have Adam Janke here today. Adam Janke is going to be talking about landscaping for wildlife. So he's going to give you ideas about attracting birds, butterflies, and more, and also helping you as a Master Gardener to use your volunteer projects to make critical habitats for birds that are coming through. A couple materials that we have for you today, we have a worksheet for you to follow along with the presentation. And on that worksheet is a link to the online evaluation. So please take a chance to go online and give us some feedback on this presentation. And while you're online, please make sure to log your two Master Gardener continuing education hours. As you know, the requirement is 10 continuing education hours each year for Master Gardeners, so please jump online to the volunteer reporting system to log your hours. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Adam Janke for our presentation today. Thanks, Adam. Hello, thanks for joining me here today, and thanks for the opportunity to present to your group. I'm excited to talk about this subject. Um, the original title of my talk was Landscapes for Wildlife or something to that effect, and I've, I've tweaked that a little bit to say making landscapes work for wildlife, and I think at the end you'll see what I mean. I feel like this is maybe a more uh, fully inclusive uh, title for the type of things that I like talking to um, people that work in urban environments or, or really human modified environments. I like to talk about uh, ways that we can change the landscape in a way that has positive impacts on our native wildlife that a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment uh, out of seeing and I assume many of you get a lot of enjoyment uh, out of seeing those things as well. So I'm really excited to be here uh, in speaking with you guys and I'm gonna first start with an introduction. I think uh, this is the first time I've ever given a webinar like this where I feel particularly anonymous. There's no uh, pictures of me here or or anything like that. So I thought I'd at least give you a face uh, to put with the name. And so here's my most recent mugshot from the university. And you can see my credentials there. I'm an assistant professor here in the Department of Natural Resource Ecology and Management. And then the title that I uh, that brings me here to you and that I spend most of my time working on is as the extension wildlife specialist. So I do all things wildlife in the state of Iowa. Uh, and that includes basically everything from from nuisance wildlife or problem wildlife that some folks uh, deal with to the things that I do my research in and I'm most interested in that's wildlife conservation and specifically uh, wildlife habitat conservation so um, as part of my job I run this website and so this is sort of a shameless plug here for uh, some of the content that I develop and like to push out and so if you have any questions you can find you know my contact information here and also some of this stuff in written form uh, on this website. There's also this mapping application uh, that you can see is just sort of cut off there in this photo. Um, but there you can find county specific contact information for anybody that works on wildlife, everything from the county conservation board to uh, nuisance wildlife control operators. So that's something that's new coming out of our program and hopefully uh, lots of additional things will be coming out of this program and you'll find those here on the website uh, if you're at all interested. One last caveat to return to this slide, I've added something there at the bottom you may see is that is I have no degrees, certifications, or formal trans or training in landscape design. So I suppose I'll start with that apology, uh, it, but I, I wanted to make that point clear because I wanted to convey to you that um, I'm not necessarily a landscape expert here. Um, but what I am, what my expertise, or at least my training is in, is understanding wildlife and understanding the landscapes that they rely on. And if you understand sort of the basic ecological principles, we can apply those in any landscape. Uh, and that's sort of my thesis here in Iowa. Iowa kind of has the reputation or um, it's probably a pretty established fact that we have one of the most modified landscapes uh, in the United States, perhaps 
the only thing that would compete for a more modified state uh, in terms of just the human footprint and the human disturbance on the land would be a really uh, urbanized environment, for example, on the East Coast or the West Coast. But a lot of those states didn't have a lot of natural areas. And here in Iowa, we have intensive row crop production, and then we have uh, a lot of urbanization. And so those uh, two things combined present with some sort of unique challenges for wildlife and wildlife habitat, and that's uh, the area in this field that I work in. And to bring that back to this whole landscape design and landscape issue, if we understand what the wildlife need, how the wildlife find those resources, and how um, and what sorts of factors negatively impact the areas where wildlife live, then we can do well by wildlife essentially in any environment where we're working and i always encourage folks to remember that absolutely anything we do on the land has some sort of impact on wildlife and there's always winners and losers if for example we build a huge storage uh, warehouse with a gravel rooftop there's going to be birds that find that really darn good habitat and if we built it in a place where there was for example an old growth virgin forest or something uh, some birds are going to lose, and those birds that nest on gravel rooftops are going to win. And so we essentially have to understand who the winners and losers are uh, and understand what sorts of wildlife we, as the people managing the land, value the most and want to see uh, in our environment, and that's how uh, we can go about our, our work. So this this aerial photograph here is taken recently uh, in the in the late 2000s here, recent times, uh, and this is just an area around Des Moines, and this is surely a familiar scene. If you haven't looked at a lot of Google Earth images or uh, satellite images, you maybe haven't seen these developments from the air, but you've certainly gotten lost in a subdivision like this before, if you're anything like me. Uh, and you know that this is, of course, a common scene, and in fact, here in Iowa, we have uh, about 8% of our land area is in urban as it, urbanized uh, land uses. Now, this is, of course, a change. Iowa has become increasingly urbanized like many states. Uh, and so here's the exact same landscape in 1930 uh, from an aerial photograph. And so here the challenges in this landscape probably relate to um, loss of, of habitats through uh, intensive land use like uh, crop growing crops or, or intensive management in the forest. Uh, and then back in our urban environment, our challenges are presented uh, because of urbanization and urban development. And so I'm going to talk today about these urban landscapes. And and I don't want to make it sound like I'm just talking about these big metropolitan areas. Any, any place where we live, it could be a farm lot uh, in the middle of a section uh, in rural Iowa, or it could be uh, one of these houses or one of these community parks here in Des Moines. Anywhere we live, uh, we can do certain things in our landscapes to have a positive impact on wildlife and also to have positive just ecological benefits uh, to address some of our big challenges that we're facing uh, in, our, in our environments today. So that's sort of the introduction uh, to where I'm headed and how I'm thinking about this subject and how I'm thinking about this talk. And I'm going to go to what I'm calling a discussion break. We're going to have, I think, three of these in the session today. And when you see this little bar and this little pause sign, that means I want you to uh, pause the, the presentation and have this discussion. Depending on how many people are in the room, you can pair up in twos or threes. Uh, and I want you to discuss this question and come up with the answers and then report out to the rest of the groups uh, and discuss what you what you came up with as to what role do urban landscapes play in our environment and our lives. And I assume this is something that master gardeners have thought a lot about because you guys obviously all care about landscapes um, in, in areas where we live, and I want you to sort of articulate some of those things. We'll pause the show here and then come back, and I'll give you my ideas, and then we'll carry on with the presentation. Okay, so now I'm going to advance to uh, my thoughts on this question. So the question I posed in the discussion you guys just had is what role do urban landscapes play in our environment and in our lives? I presume, like I said, this is something that you guys have thought a fair bit about. 
Um, and, and I've listed here my thoughts or my answers to this question. And this is an opportunity. This would be a place where it would have been really nice to have been there uh, with you guys uh, while you're doing this exercise to discuss these things. But I'll give you my thoughts. If you think I missed any major ones, I'd love to hear from you. And I'll have my contact information later. Um, and we'll sort of see where it goes from there. So the first the first is the aesthetics and quality of life. I think this is probably one that we all think of right away. Why do we landscape stuff? It's because it looks really nice and it's fun uh, and rewarding to see nice landscapes uh, in our urban urban environments. It's fun to see those uh, anywhere we go. So we like to see things in bloom different times of the year and um, we may have um, functional roles for landscapes like hiding uh, certain parts of the house or windows or shade or things like that. Uh, there's, there's also value in urban landscapes and cultural and education engage, in educational engagement in natural areas. And this is one where I think, of course, we have lots of people live in the cities. We're a r mostly rural state, but lots of our population lives in the cities. And maybe they don't necessarily have a chance to go out into a big prairie or into a big forest uh, like people in more rural areas do. And so uh, landscapes and urban environments can provide a really important uh, opportunity area for education um, just on natural things and then also cultural education to understand uh, what our landscape once looked like and where our landscape, uh, what our landscape looks like today. Another thing that, of course, is important to me is this idea of supporting biodiversity, and that includes uh, wildlife, but it also includes everything from um, insects to plant life to all sorts of different biodiversity that we, that we find in our world. And those are, of course, important things, and urban landscapes play an important role there. They also, uh, it's an important role, and this is one that I'll spend more time talking about, is that they play an important role in protecting natural areas. So what we do in the urban areas has an impact on the natural areas, and we're going to talk a fair bit about that. Building on that concept is what we do in urban areas has impacts on these big uh, global challenges that we're dealing with, uh, things like uh, climate change. Uh, of course, a lot of greenhouse gases are emitted out of urban areas, and we've, of course, changed a lot of those landscapes from what would have been uh, plant life that does a good job of sequestering or capturing carbon uh, and associated greenhouse gases, and we've changed them into things that are not living, uh, and that creates some challenges. And so urban landscapes can play an important role in addressing for example, climate change. They can also, if they're built right in, and uh, have the right landscape elements, we know we have lots of um, challenges related to increased frequency and severity of uh, severe storm events, and, and urban areas can, if designed right, help with flood mitigation. Uh, and we this concept of urban heat islands, that's a consequence of, of uh, our a manifestation of warming temperatures. We know the cities are just warmer anyway because of lots of things going on there with uh, the way solar radiation is reflected. And the right landscapes can help abate those impacts. And then finally, fighting causes and consequences of water quality degradation. Uh, the right landscapes and the right landscape elements can help us address uh, challenges related to uh, water quality that we certainly have here in Iowa and, and uh, across the United States. So that's sort of my really broad list. And I, as I said, I suspect you guys probably came up with some other ideas. Uh, and I'd love to hear any major ones that I missed uh, if you shoot me an email here at the end of the talk. Um, and I hope that sort of captures some of the conversations that you had. Now, I'm not going to talk about all these things I got. There's there's a lot going on with an urban landscape, and I'm certainly not an expert on all these subjects. Uh, but the two that I'm going to talk about the most today is this idea of supporting biodiversity, and particularly wildlife. And when I'm talking about wildlife, I'm thinking of things uh, like birds and mammals and, and reptiles and amphibians. And then uh, protecting natural areas. Uh, from invasions that originate in urban landscapes. And so those are the two things I'll focus on today and two important roles uh, for these urban environments that I uh, envision in thinking about making landscapes work for wildlife.
Okay. So I like to do my talks. I like to sort of give you the uh, rundown here of, of the main takeaway points. And these are them. The, these four points are sort of what I want you to walk away from this uh, presentation thinking about. In, in order to make a landscape work for wildlife, we need to mow less and mow less often. We need to mimic natural places. We need to choose diverse either native or benign exotic plants, and those are some terms I'll define. Uh, and then we need to protect wildlife and protect natural habitats. And then I talk about natural habitats, thinking of sort of natural areas um, away from our urban landscapes. So I'm going to step through each one of these categories uh, and show you some pictures and, and share some thoughts about each one of these steps. The first rule here is mow less and mow less often. I tell anybody that works on the land, this is the same instructions. It doesn't matter if you're mowing roadside ditches in the middle of nowhere or if you're mowing turf grass in the middle of Des Moines. Um, mowing isn't doing a lot for wildlife and mowing actually, uh, with a few exceptions, isn't doing uh, much good for anything other than sort of an aesthetic uh, angle and here's here's just an example of two side-by-side -side yards uh here that i just took over the weekend uh because i thought the yard on the right had uh more consistent with my idea of what uh in a working landscape uh should look like now i i recognize this isn't going to necessarily fit for everybody but trying to increase the amount of landscapes uh in in anywhere that we work um and trying to decrease the amount of turf grass can do a lot of good. So here's sort of a schematic of the same idea. The, the picture on the left is uh, a lawn that's very simple. Uh, this picture on the right is one that's more complex, and it applies a lot of the principles we're going to talk about later in terms of mimicking natural places and choosing diverse and native plants. Um, but the point here is essentially that uh, turf grass isn't doing much good uh, for wildlife, it isn't doing much good for greenhouse gas challenges. It's not doing much good for water quality. It's simply just not a great use of land outside of, of course, areas that we need for recreation or safety or things like that. And so I've thought um, any chance that I get, I like to promote the idea of thinking about diversifying our landscapes and reducing the amount of turf grass basically to the level uh, the amount of turf grass that you need to use. Um, and so I kind of joke with folks, and of course it depends on who's in the audience and and um, what their attitudes are towards turf grass, but I, imagine, I can imagine few scenarios where anybody needs more than an acre of turf grass uh, because an acre is, of course, a football field. That's how we learn it uh, early on in life. And I can't imagine more than an organized football game uh, going on in someone's backyard. So if you... Uh, know someone or are working somewhere where there's more uh, than an acre of turf grass and maybe we need to think about diversifying those landscapes uh, and we're going to talk about some of those reasons but of course turf grass takes a lot of inputs there's a lot of mowing that goes on there's a lot of uh, herbicides uh, and pesticides that are used on those um, and then they have really shallow roots so they don't really function much like our natural environments do uh, in terms of um, taking up water and also sequestering uh, carbon. And so we have a lot more opportunity uh, for improving those metrics in landscapes. And then also just landscapes, as you guys certainly know, are just more uh, aesthetically pleasing as well. So uh, that's my sort of soapbox um, on, on this whole turf grass issue. And uh, that's take home number one. The, the second component to think about in our urban landscapes is when we're starting to put together pieces of a landscape, like for example, in that plan that I showed on the last slide, we want to think about mimicking natural places. Um, and so mimicking natural places, essentially we, what we need to think about is what do the wildlife, whatever our target wildlife uh, species are, and a lot of times for me, at least it's birds, uh, what do they need from the landscape in order to make it useful uh, during some time of their life. And of course, what we need, no matter where we are, what wildlife need, no matter where they are uh, in the world, is habitat. 
And habitat is the combined contributions of these four elements. So every wildlife species needs food, water, and shelter, place to eat, a place to drink, and a place to to rest and escape the elements. And then they also need space because just like all of us, we can't live right on top of one another. We have various uh, demands for spacing out for uh, in the case of wildlife, for example, reproduction, they need different space or wintering areas, they need different space. And so we combine food, water and shelter, and then we consider how much individual space each species needs. And that creates this uh, idea of habitat. Now, every species has a different sort of definition of habitat. Every species eats different foods. Uh, some species of wildlife absolutely need surface water. Other species of wildlife are content getting by with uh, the water they get from their food or a little bit of dew on the grass in the morning or snow. Um, there's, uh, of course, differences in shelter. Some wildlife like to live inside of things. Some things just hide, for example, in dense vegetation. Uh, some wildlife, of course, we know live under the ground. Um, and so they all have sort of different definitions of this, but I'm going to just step through sort of the big considerations for these four, uh, different elements, uh, to think about when you're putting together your landscape. And if you identify a specific species of wildlife that you really want to attract, uh, then, then we can work with you and feel free to reach out to me or find resources online, uh, to figure out what exactly the food, water, shelter, and space needs of that species uh, of wildlife are. So on this food thing, people are often tempted to jump right to artificial food sources. And I actually didn't even include artificial food sources in my slides. That is, of course, an important um, uh, way of attracting wildlife to your yard. And a lot of people get a lot of enjoyment out of that. I didn't include it here just because it, is, it doesn't seem like a landscape element. Uh, the better sort of way to feed wildlife in our landscaping is by planting the food. Um, and food comes in all sorts of different uh, varieties, of course. So the one here on the left is one that's pretty obvious and comes to mind. Uh, and those are plants that produce a fruit. Uh, two different types of fruit. We, we talk about fleshy fruits like these dogwood berries, uh, but we also talk about hard fruits, what we call hard mast, things like acorns, hickory nuts, and walnuts. Uh, and both of those are important pieces of, uh, or landscape elements to include. And, uh, we can plant them and then they reliably grow and the wildlife use them year after year. The picture here on the right is a food source that we may not think about. We think uh, flowering plants, and in this case, butterfly milkweed. We think, well, that's just aesthetically pleasing or provides structure or something like that for wildlife. But, of course, nectar is really important for a lot of uh, pollinating insects. Um, and it's also uh, really important for things like hummingbirds, certain types of flowers. Um, and, and then also flowering plants attract insects because they're pollinating them or, or eating the vegetation on them. Uh, and insects attract a lot of birds and a lot of different wildlife. And so we can essentially plant these different things. For example, flowering plants that flower at different times throughout the year, uh, f different types of fruiting plants, and we can plant essentially a buffet uh, right in our landscapes. So that's probably the first and most important consideration uh, in thinking about wildlife habitat uh, in our landscapes. The next one is water sources. Here's two different pictures or ideas of what a water source in a landscape may look like. The one on the left, of course, is just a bird feeder, um, or excuse me, a bird watering bath. Um, and a lot of folks enjoy putting those out and those are nice, uh, areas for birds to, to get surface water. Uh, the one on the right is a neat picture where, um, this homeowner has built his own pond in his backyard and landscaped around it with native plants. And this is all to attract birds. Uh, and he attracts a lot of different types of birds uh, to the yard because this is such a unique feature uh, in certain species need um, these types of plants or they need uh, that surface water specifically. And so it's sort of a different consideration uh, to have in your landscapes. Another thing that I'll have a resource at the end of the presentation here for um, but don't have up here is rain gardens and rain gardens. We can put 
uh, native wetland vegetation into, and they provide important functions in urban landscapes with uh, addressing um, stormwater runoff, but they also can provide good wildlife habitat as well. Another type of, uh, this is sort of shelter, and this also can be food, is things like woody debris and also cavities in the trees. So the picture here on the left is just a down log. Um, and if you can have down woody debris in your landscape, I've seen it um, take all sorts of different shapes and sizes in landscapes. Some people just leave a log uh, sort of hidden among the bushes. Uh, some people decorate logs. Uh, some people decorate old stumps. Um, in any way you sort of go about it, logs can be a really good source of habitat for a lot of insects. And then a lot of other critters will, of course, find them useful as well uh, to eat the insects or to hide underneath or something like that. And then cavities are another important landscape element. And here on the right are two different types of cavities. Um, and, of course, we have lots of different critters that either create their own cavities, and that's the case of woodpeckers. Uh, woodpeckers excavate their own holes. And then lots of other stuff comes in and uses a woodpecker's hole uh, when they're done with it. We call those secondary cavity nesters. And uh, leaving trees in our landscapes uh, or dead branches on trees uh, where cavities could be formed uh, can be a really nice landscape element as long as it's uh, safe, not too close to the house or anything. We can also think about artificial structures and uh, wildlife will use just about anything you put out here. Here's just a broken pot that's turned upside down and a few critters like to escape the elements up underneath that. Uh, and then, of course, the more familiar things are things like birdhouses. And in this case, a bluebird box um, can be a nice uh, landscape element to have um, if the food and the cover uh, around it are, are already there. And then finally, I like to encourage folks to remember that a lot of our wildlife uh, stick around during the winter time. Now, this isn't true of many of our migratory birds, but uh, we certainly have wildlife year-round. And the picture here on the right is a picture from here on campus that I took. Uh, and you can just barely see a rabbit there in the middle. And there were a ton of rabbits using this leftover growth from last year. This was a mix of, of uh, flowering plants and um, residual grasses and you know a lot of times we remove this stuff at the tail end of the growing season but if you want to provide good habitat for wildlife think about leaving this kind of stuff to provide a warm safe place for wildlife to spend uh, the winters and this is true of course of many birds that we have that winter here and uh, also the rabbits and then the picture there on the left evergreen shrubs uh, and trees can be really important during the winter time uh, to provide warm uh, habitat for a lot of different uh, critters, for example, when it snows. Okay, so we want to think about landscaping more in our, air, in our urban landscapes, and we want to think about mimicking natural places in our urban landscapes, and now we want to think about what to put in uh, into those landscapes, what sorts of plant species. And so I'm going to advocate that you choose diverse plants, or excuse me, I'm going to advocate that you choose native plants, but the most important thing that we do in our urban areas is that we choose a diversity of plants and that we choose plants that don't have potential to invade natural areas. And we're going to spend some time at the end, uh, at the la on the last bullet, talking about what characteristics make a plant most likely to invade natural areas and what plants to avoid. Uh, and so I'll have these two terms, native plants or benign exotic plants, uh, to think about. But I am going to emphasize this idea of native plants, and that's simply just because I think there's um, a lot of educational and cultural value in promoting native plants in, additional, in addition to their potential to provide good uh, wildlife habitat throughout the year and also those native plants are of course most adapted to Iowa's climate um, because they've always grown here grown here for many uh, thousands of years so I'm going to work through this is back out into my comfort zone the natural areas uh, and I'm going to work through a few of these different 
uh, ecosystems that we have in Iowa and just talk about some of the plants. And I'm certainly not the horticulture uh, expert that you're accustomed to listening to, but I'll show you a few of these plants that I think are pretty neat, and then we can um, get much longer lists from the from the experts as well. So this is the tall grass prairie. Iowa is really just a tall grass prairie state. Over 85% of our landscape prior to European settlement was in the tall grass prairie ecosystem. We're the only state that is, was just completely covered uh, from border to border with tall grass prairie. As we go east, it of course got more wooded. As we went west, it transitioned to mixed and short grass be prairies because of the um, increasing uh, aridity to the west. Uh, and so Iowa was just the heart of the tall grass prairie, and over 300 species of plants uh, have been documented to grow in tall grass prairie. And so I've always thought uh, th there's 300 plants we could find uh, enough to diversify our urban landscapes from there. Here's a picture I took at a really pretty prairie at um, Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge last summer. And just looking around this picture, I thought, man, there's a lot of uh, diversity there. Just what I could see without really close inspection there was culver's root white wild indigo lead plant rattlesnake master purple coneflower gray-headed coneflower and bergamot and then of course there's a bunch of different grass species and there's even uh, other species of forbs where i run out ran out of space or i couldn't quite tell what they were from this photograph uh in this picture and i've seen all of these species in landscapes um and so we find lots of potential uh in these tall grass prairie uh, native plants for our urban areas. The one that I suspect you've heard a lot about in the last five years or so is we're talking a lot about our concerns about uh, monarch butterflies. And monarch butterflies, as I'm sure you all know very well, uh, require milkweeds as their host plant to raise their young. Uh, and so we encourage a lot of folks to think about uh, taking some of these native prairie milkweed plants and putting them in uh, to their landscapes uh, wherever they can. And it's always nice when we recommend a plant that's really darn pretty. And that's certainly the case with these three species. And there's lots of other species of milkweeds um, that are also uh, very aesthetically pleasing uh, that we can incorporate into our landscapes. Here's uh, just some really common native wildflowers. Um, when we talk about these pollinator issues, for example, with the monarch butterfly or with um, native bees or any pollinators, it's not just milkweeds that are going to get us out of this challenge. We need a diversity of flowering plants that flower throughout the year. So we need stuff flowering early in the spring, early summer, late summer, and all the way in uh, to the fall in some cases to provide nectar sources for all things, including monarch butterflies. And so we want to think beyond milkweeds, and we want to think uh, about this diverse portfolio of native wildflowers that are available. And here are just re three really common ones. The other thing that we see a lot coming out of our prairies is native grasses. And these native grasses oftentimes are, I just learned this word, and I like it, native ours. So they're cultivars that are native species, so they've been adapted to have characteristics that make them grow um, in more favorable ways or look uh, different in urban environments. And um, these are two examples that we see a lot in landscapes, prairie drop seed and little blue stem. And then, of course, uh, there's a whole bunch of other grasses that are available uh, and can be planted in our native landscapes from our tall grass prairie ecosystems. The next ecosystem in Iowa, we estimate that about 7% of the state was covered in, in mature closed canopy forest. And then there was another probably 10% or maybe even more where it was sort of a loose open canopy of forest uh, or open canopy of, of trees and prairie grasses that we call savannas. And there we find a big diversity of native plants, again, to choose from uh, in our in our landscapes. And so some examples of good forest plants to think about including into your landscapes. These are what we call spring ephemerals. So stuff that comes on early and blooms uh, with the first flush of warm spring vegetation. 
in the forest floor. Uh, things like Virginia bluebells, shooting star, and Dutchman's breeches are neat examples of a really uh, long list of native spring ephemeral wildflowers um, that we can that we can use in our landscapes where it's shady um, and and there isn't uh, too much ground cover there already. Now, these plants, spring ephemerals particularly, have had a pretty hard uh, go at it recently because of challenges related to invasive species. One characteristic we'll talk about with invasive species is their tendency to put on leaves really early in the year and, and drop their leaves really late in the year, and that's led to the declines of a lot of our spring ephemeral wildflowers. Uh, and so it'd be nice to see those come back in our urban landscapes where we can control uh, the vegetation a little more directly. Later in the year, we have lots of different plants that come on, and here's just two examples, uh, maidenhair fern and then uh, American alamrood as two native um, possibilities to include in your landscapes from our forests. And then wetlands, we had a lot of wetlands in Iowa, particularly in north central Iowa in the area that we call the prairie pothole region. Uh, of course, we've lost a lot of our wetlands in the state, um, but those that remain have a diverse assemblage of native plants. And a lot of these native plants have been adapted to our landscapes. They can either uh, grow in essentially moist areas or things like rain gardens um, or even backyard ponds have given us a place to grow native wetland plants, uh, things that need to either be wet or in really wet uh, soils. And so here's just a really quick example of three uh, species of wetland plants that I really think are aesthetically pleasing and we see a lot in landscapes. Blue flag iris, cardinal flower, and elderberry is a shrub um, that are all associated with wet areas and there's a long list of other plant species that we'd see in wet areas and could fit really nicely into our landscapes. Okay, in our final take-home message or recommendation for making landscapes work for wildlife is to protect the wildlife and also to protect the natural habitats. So we're going to tackle those two things sort of separately. Uh, first, this idea about protecting wildlife. And there I want to say, essentially, consider what how you're attracting wildlife to your yard. And you probably don't want to create a yard that's really good deer habitat right next to a four-lane highway. Um, seems like sort of uh, common knowledge, but we do want to think about what sort of risks we may be uh, exposing the wildlife to or people going by uh, and, of course, uh, make efforts to reduce those risks uh, with the way that we do our landscaping. And then also, um, we don't want to attract a bunch of, for example, native birds to our yard uh, just to have outdoor cats um, capture them and eat them. And uh, this is a really big challenge. In fact, it's estimated that uh, outdoor cats are the number one unnatural cause of mortality among uh, small mammals and among birds in North America. And the estimate of the annual number of birds that are killed by outdoor cats uh, is in the billions every year, uh, we estimate. Uh, every year we estimate um, 1.4 to 3.7 billion birds uh, are killed by outdoor cats. So we always like to encourage folks to keep their cats indoors any time uh, we get a chance to, but it's also just a consideration to make is you probably don't want uh, to do a lot of good landscaping that's going to attract a lot of birds, uh, but may be used by the neighbor's uh, outdoor cat. So an additional consideration to make. And now finally, I said protect wildlife and then protect natural areas. And so I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation here today talking about this idea of protecting natural areas. And so this is a picture that I took in Ledges State Park, which is a really neat park, big continuous forest just west of Ames here. Um, and this shrub, I don't know if anybody recognizes that, but it's Japanese barberry. As we know from the name, Japanese means it's not native to uh, North America. Uh, in, in this case, it's invaded this natural area in Ledges State Park uh, and is, of course, competing with the native plants. Uh, 
So this is an example of an exotic invasive shrub uh, that's starting to cause uh, problems in our natural areas because of its origins in urban landscapes. Here's another example of the result of an invasive species. This is sort of taken at what I'd consider like a wildlife view or a bird's eye view of the understory of a bush honeysuckle invasion. In this, what happens, the only thing growing on the ground floor in this picture is honeysuckle. And honeysuckle has a lot of characteristics that uh, make it really competitive and capable of completely out competing our native forest vegetation. It completely changes the structure of the forest uh, vegetation and wildlife find it essentially unusable. And so it's a major challenge um, along with a, a, a long list of other exotic invasive woody plants um, that create challenges in our natural areas. And here's one final example. This is another example of one that clearly escaped uh, from, from landscapes. This is Chinese silver grass. I've heard it called plume grass um, and some other names. Um, and that's why I put the scientific name there. But this is a, an invaded roadside. You'll note that the only thing growing in that roadside is this grass. And that's a problem because wildlife need diversity in all animals, uh, pollinators and everything else need a diversity of plants. They need flowering plants and they need open uh, structure uh, to be able to move through these areas. And when it gets invaded by an exotic species like this, they simply just find them unusable. And this picture was taken here in central Iowa as well. So just three examples to sort of convey, I guess, sort of dispatches from the natural areas. So uh, what impacts we're seeing of escaped uh, cultivated plants in our uh, natural areas. And we need to think about how we can design our urban landscapes in a way that minimizes their negative impacts on the remaining natural areas that we have here in our state. So with that, we're going to do another discussion. We're going to do the same thing we did last year, last time. Turn to your partner for three minutes and quickly discuss this question and then report out to the group and have a discussion in the room. Uh, and here's the question. What factors place ornamental plant species, so those that we plant in our urban landscapes, at risk of invading natural areas? Okay, here's my thoughts on the answer to that question. I've thought time to maturity, so that is how fast the plants grow and reproduce can affect its probability of escaping urban areas and getting into natural areas. Seed dispersal strategy. So this is, I think, a really big one, and we have some research to support this, that the types of plants that are most likely to leave our urban areas or leave our landscapes and invade our natural areas are those that can hitch a ride in a bird, so to speak, uh, or those that can be dispersed by the wind. So this bird issue, those examples of those exotic shrubs that I showed you, Japanese barberry and uh, bush honeysuckle, the way those get to Ledges State Park from our urban areas is not because those seeds are picked up and moved there by some person or somebody's planting it uh, in the park. It's because birds find those seeds in the cities. Those seeds are designed to survive going through a bird. That's how those fleshy fruits work. And so the seed, the bird eats the fleshy fruit and then um, defecates the seed. And where the seed lands is where the seed grows, obviously. Um, and we see that uh, this re process repeat itself time and time again where birds pick up see fruits from urban areas and translate translocate them out to the natural areas. And so this is a really common uh, challenge that we see. We also see challenges with wind dispersed seeds and that's just because there's fewer barriers uh, to getting a wind dispersed seed out of the city and into the natural areas. So the uh, Chinese silver stem grass that I showed, 
uh, that has a really light, fluffy seed, and that can blow a long ways. Uh, and it also reproduces vegetatively, so once it's established, it can really take over. Uh, and then another thing uh, that I came up in, with in my list here is climate and ecological ch tolerances in their native range. So it's unlikely if we bring a grass or an exotic species from, uh, for example, the Saharan desert uh, into our urban environments, it's probably unlikely they're going to do very well here in Iowa. Uh, but what we do know from some nice research that's been done here at Iowa State uh, and elsewhere is that the plants that invade our natural areas here in Iowa originate from climates that are similar on different continents. So this look at the comp, the dark shaded areas or areas where plants that have successfully invaded Iowa natural areas. Uh, it's where their natural ranges overlap. So the darker the area, the more overlapping natural ranges uh, of plants that have been successful in invading Iowa uh, woodlands, in this case, for non-native woody plants. And so what we see is that we get a lot of stuff from southeastern Asia and central Asia and Europe. Uh, and that's just because the climatological conditions are similar. Those things are brought over here on a ship, and then they land here in this new world, and they find all of those pests that once ate their leaves or ate their bark or branches uh, are no longer around because they've moved to a different continent. But the climate conditions are very similar to the climate in which they uh, survive in their natural range, and so they take off in the absence of any natural predators. And so this is a challenge that we see sort of playing out uh, with lots of different species, and in this case, 28 non-native uh, woody species. We have a few of these other uh, species here listed that show uh, they came from southeastern United States or their natural range was southeastern United States. That's not as much of a problem. Those plants don't tend to be quite as invasive. Um, rather, the most invasive ones are those that come from a different continent and have uh, a different uh, complete or no natural predators here uh, on our continent. So I'm talking about native plants or I'm talking about benign exotics. Uh, how in the world do we know what is going to be a safe plant to plant uh, in our landscapes? There's lots of different definitions of what constitutes a native plant. Now we can probably rule out the one in the bottom right here. We don't, uh, this is the only planet we found so far that grows life. Uh, and so Sure, it may be native to our our planet, but it's going to create problems if it's from a different continent. So we probably want to at least focus on our own continent. Then we could go uh, to North America. Now, we certainly see fewer challenges with plants from North America invading uh, our natural areas here in Iowa. But there are certainly scenarios where we can imagine that major barriers that would have limited the dispersal of a plant species, for example, mountains, uh, or or substantial changes in climate, for example, the, the really dry areas to our west, um, may allow for a plant that's moved here uh, from North America to invade our natural areas, though it's certainly less likely. Then the opposite end of the spectrum is there's some people that say if it's not native to within 50 miles of here, then it shouldn't be planted here. My personal opinion is that's probably a little too specific I think something more regional is appropriate. Uh, and so that's why I have this picture here in the upper right uh, of the upper Midwest. It's probably safe to say if it was uh, native to a bordering state or a state here in the upper Midwest, it probably could have found its way to Iowa at some point if it was going to invade our areas. Uh, and since it hasn't found its way here yet, it's probably safe uh, to plant. And that opens up, of course, a lot of different species that we find in the northern lake states or in uh, the plains uh, to the west or um, that we can put into our landscapes that maybe aren't technically native to Iowa or they certainly aren't native to a 50-mile radius of many counties, uh, but they're still a safe bet. So that's sort of my own uh, take on that. Okay, so how do you know what a native plant is? So we have a few resources. The Iowa DOT actually, because of their living roadway uh, trust fund initiative have a really nice website where you can search uh, lists of native plants. So I've thought if you're at the greenhouse and you want to know if something is a native uh, species, this is a really good resource to try uh, to use. 
The other thing is the USDA has this plants database that's a really nice resource. They have pictures and information about uh, each plant species, and then they show whether or not it's native, which in this case here is shown in green on that map, uh, or introduced, and in that case here uh, is the blue areas. So that's a good resource that, that you can use. Okay, so we're going to break things up a little bit. We're going to have a friendly competition uh, identifying different plants. And specifically, we're going to just talk about woody plants uh, because those are the ones that present the most challenges in our natural areas or at least in our woodland areas. Uh, and uh, they can be pretty hard to identify. So we're going to have a quiz. Um, you've got blanks on your worksheet to complete this quiz. And what I want somebody in the room is to take score uh, of what the room comes up with. You guys can work together on this, or if you want, you can break into pairs, however you want to do it. Uh, but somebody send me the score for the room or the best score in the room uh, for this quiz. And then at the end of this webinar series this year, we'll announce the winner uh, on Twitter or something. Um, and you'll have bragging rights for at least a year, maybe even longer. So... Okay, so break into your uh, teams or however you want to break this up, and then I'm going to advance, uh, and you can pause on each individual species uh, to, to allow enough time and enough inspection, but no Googling. Okay, so the first one, round is a practice round, so you can just stay live with me here. Uh, at this point on the regular slides, you could pause, uh, take a look at the pictures that I'm providing, and then... Uh, wait for and then I'll carry on with the answer but for this one uh, take a look at those leaves and take a look at that tree growth structure um, and come up with what what species of tree this is we want to know the common name or an appro a, a approved common name and you can use your judgment on that the scientific name which of course uh, there's only one right answer there and then I want you to tell me whether or not it's a native or an exotic invasive species so for this tree, of course, we'd see those little tiny leaves and that elm-like growth structure, and we'd know that that's not one of our native elms, uh, and rather that's Siberian elm. And that's, of course, an exotic and invasive species that we see finding its way uh, into our woodlots uh, where we don't necessarily want it. So that's how this game will work. We're going to work through the next couple of slides and... Um, you can pause and do what you need to do uh, to keep up. All right. This one I'm going to reveal as Blackhaw. This is one of our native viburnum species. Okay, this one I'm going to reveal as burning bush, Euonymus alatus. And this is an exotic invasive species. And this one is one that I often get a lot of surprises in the audience. This one and Japanese barberry are the two biggest surprises. Because hands down, this is probably the most commonly planted uh, exotic invasive, along with Japanese barberry, in our landscapes. Um, and this is one, along with Japanese barberry, that we're seeing coming on more and more in our natural areas. The picture here on the right really shows the, the winged branching uh, or the winged pattern on the, on the twigs of burning bush or this species of euonymus. And um, you, you can use that to, to identify it. And I took that picture in a natural area in Des Moines County that was just overrun with this burning bush, this exotic invasive shrub. And so we really want to encourage folks to try to keep this out of their landscapes uh, whenever they can. Because, again, the birds are picking it up and moving it out into the natural areas. Okay, next one. 
I'll reveal this one as Tartarian Honeysuckle, Lanicera tartarica. And this is an exotic invasive shrub. This looks much like uh, bush honeysuckle, the one I've already shown you. Uh, the, the leaves are a little different shape. If you look closely, they also have a pink flower, um, whereas bush honeysuckle has a white flower. Um, we see this just like bush honeysuckle invades natural areas and is the first to leaf out and the last to drop its leaves. And it's a real problem uh, and a real challenge for uh, uh, wooded areas. This is at the top of my list of the most offensive uh, exotic invasive shrubs. And I'm happy to report I just removed this from my own landscaping just a few weeks ago. Okay, the next one. Okay, I'll reveal this. I hope folks recognize this as Eastern Wahoo. Euonymus atropurpureus is how I learned how to pronounce that native shrub's uh, name. This is a really neat native burning bush. It has the same characteristics of that exotic winged Euonymus uh, or the exotic burning bush uh, in that it turns this bright red color in the uh, fall time. And these have a beautiful pink flower and these pink or excuse me, pink fruits uh, and the pink fruits provide their own sort of unique flush of color. Um, and I think make it even uh, more aesthetically pleasing than that exotic uh, burning bush. Okay, we'll advance to the next one. All right, I'll reveal this one, and I'm curious if folks got it. This is European high bush cranberry. Um, you won't have won't be surprised then with European being in the name that it's an exotic and has potential to be an invasive species. Now we have a native high bush cranberry. Um, that native is Viburnum opulus, and I'll actually advance and show you the photo of that native. Now, this is it's really hard to tell the difference between the native American highbush cranberry and the exotic highbush high cranberry. Um, I have a link uh, in my notes from the PowerPoint where I was reading about how to tell the difference, and I can share that with you if you'd like to follow up with me. It has to do with the glands on the petiole of the leaf. Um, so it's a really hard thing to tell. Now, we say, I, I hear from folks a lot of times, well, if they only differ by the, the, some tiny indistinguishable characteristic of the leaf, why can't we just plant the exotic one and not the native one? The problem is, is because they still have different physiological or growth strategies um, between the exotic and the native one. And the exotic one tends to be more aggressive. And it tends to be, of course, used less uh, by wildlife. So we want we want to focus on American highbush cranberry, and the v best way to do that is to confirm that scientific name uh, when you're buying it at the greenhouse um, and before we're putting it into our, our landscapes. Okay, we'll advance to the next one. And I'll reveal this as buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis. This is a favorite of mine uh, because I do a lot of my work on wet, in wetlands. And this plant grows right in uh, a wetland. Uh, but it also grows in sort of wet sites. I actually just planted a, a cultivar or a, a nativar, as we say, of this in my own yard. Uh, it has this beautiful white f uh, flower and, and fruit. Uh, later in the year, and it is, of course, uh, a native plant. So uh, would be a good one for any wet, wet sites um, or, or, and even better in, for example, a rain garden. So we'll advance to another one. <laughs> 
And I'll reveal this as nine bark physiocarpus oblifolius. I don't laugh at me with those. Uh, and this is a native shrub. Here again, this is probably a native R the, that's been bred to have that sort of red hue on the right. Uh, but it's still the same genus and species, and we find this uh, in our natural areas as well. It has a really pretty flaky uh, bark that is uh, pretty year-round. Uh, and when the leaves drop, it still is something nice to sort of look at. Uh, and I see this on a lot of landscapes, and it's nice to see uh, a native shrub in our landscapes. Okay, we'll advance to another one. Okay, I'll reveal that as wayfaring tree, Viburnum lantana. And this is another exotic invasive shrub. Here um, we, we can see that opposite branching pattern, typical of Viburnums, but that uh, leaf is pretty diagnostic in terms of it being an exotic plant or not one of our natives. Uh, the fruits are a little different looking as well uh, in my assessment. And I see this in, in a lot of landscapes. I actually haven't seen this uh, firsthand in a natural area yet, but it's on the list of um, one that has been documented to invade natural areas. And it's also one that we worry about because it's spread by fruits, spread by birds. Uh, and, of course, it's native uh, to a uh, climate that would make it uh, more likely to invade our natural areas. So it's one to avoid uh, in our landscapes. Okay, and we'll reveal this one as red osier dogwood, Cornus cerisia, and this is a native shrub. Uh, this is a really pretty native shrub. I'm sure you've all seen these bright red twigs while you drive the interstates in the wintertime. Uh, my colleague Gabby Edwards here in our department likes to call those hardworking pretty shrubs because they're not only pretty when they flower, they're not only pretty when their leaves uh, turn red in the fall, but they're pretty year-round when you can see those bright red twigs um, throughout the wintertime. So uh, this is another really pretty native uh, shrub that we can put in our landscapes uh, in place of some of those exotic and problematic ones. Okay, so that wraps up my talking points today uh, about making landscapes work for wildlife. What I want you to do in sort of your last exercise here, your last discussion, and then I'll wrap things up real quickly here at the end, uh, is to do the same thing we've been doing, the same exercise. Turn to your partner, three minutes and discuss, and then report out to the group. What could you do in your community to combat invasive plants and make landscapes work for wildlife? And so this was a question that... Um, Susan prompted uh, for the Master Gardener program is essentially to try to think about how we can apply some of these principles um, to make our urban or our landscapes and, and specifically the volunteer work that you guys do uh, work for wildlife or work for our natural areas. So come up with some ideas and maybe some uh, bounce some ideas off your partners and, and uh, have a nice discussion. I'll come back. I'll give you a few of my thoughts uh, and then we'll wrap things up. All right, so I've thought, of course, in sort of wrapping this talk up, there's a lot of things that we could potentially do uh, in our landscapes to make our landscapes work better for wildlife and also to deal with invasive plants. And so here's my, my list. Um, and just like all the other questions, if you have other ideas, I'd love to hear them uh, in a follow-up email. Um, Advocate for, for, for or plant native gardens and community landscapes. Uh, that builds on the one to the right where I said organize an outdoor classroom with native plantings. Uh, what better way to teach our kids about our state flower than to find prairie rows right outside the door of the classroom or to learn about how I Iowa was once 85% tall grass prairie than to have a chance to run around in the tall grass prairie and see the flowers and bloom and all the grasses. Um, 
replace invasive species and landscapes with natives or benign exotics. And again, we have some resources available to help you identify what natives or benign exotics uh, you can use. Um, one resource that I forgot to include in my slides, but you could use is called the Midwest Invasive Plant Network. And they actually have an app for an iPhone uh, that lists the most problematic exotic species that you can buy at a greenhouse. And then it gives you a whole list of uh, alternatives that are uh, structurally or floristically or some in some way comparable that fall on our list of either natives, which we prefer, or benign exotics, uh, which are fine as well. Uh, so I encourage you to look into that and find burning bush, find Japanese barberry, find Tartarian honeysuckle or um, Siberian elm or tree of heaven or any of these exotic shrubs or, or plants that we have in our landscapes and try through time to get them replaced uh, with some nice natives or benign exotics. Organize efforts to control exotic species in natural areas around the community. Of course, uh, one of my favorite Aldo Leopold quotes is something like, uh, one of the casualties of an ecological education is that we live in a world of wounds. And once you have an eye for exotic species, you find them everywhere. And uh, I imagine many of you, just like me, find that uh, to be living in a world of wounds, wounds so to speak. Um, where you see uh, an exotic species from southeastern Asia in the understory of our woodlands, and you know that it could be a carpet of spring ephemerals uh, in the springtime. So work with people to educate on what those areas are and try to improve them uh, to, to promote our native uh, species in natural areas. Plant, plant rain gardens with native wetland plants. There's lots of reasons that those can be really beneficial in our urban areas. They can address the whole suite of challenges that we said our urban landscapes can address. Uh, and we can have some really pretty plants like sweet flag and blue iris and marsh marigold and elderberry and the list goes on and on. And then finally, I think communicate with local nurseries about stocking and promoting natives or benign exotics. I... Um, have seen some really neat examples of that. I'll show you a picture here from a local nursery in Ames uh, that I visited uh, earlier this year, and they had this really neat tent set up. They called it Pollinator Cafe. You walked in there, and there was just um, a whole uh, a, a large set of native prairie wildflowers that you could grab uh, to go home and plant your own pollinator garden. Uh, I think if every greenhouse across the state was doing this more often, a lot of people would have a lot more awareness of the importance of native pollinators uh, and native plants uh, to protect pollinators. Uh, and, and I think it's a role that master gardeners could play. Or maybe that's an idea to, to advocate for some of these things uh, in your own neighborhood if this is something that sort of resonates with you and you find interesting. So um, that's all I have to say. I'm going to offer a few um resources for you to follow up on just really quickly. This is an article we just had come out attracting birds to your yard uh, that sort of goes through some of these things that we just uh, talked about in a little bit more detail, particularly about the specific of specifics with some wildlife uh, or some birds and some specifics with feeding. Uh, also, there's some nice resources from the horticulture folks about uh, gardening for butterflies and pollinators and also rain gardens and, and a whole lot of other things, uh, resources on the extension store uh, that you can download um, and, and apply some of these principles. And then finally, please feel free to follow up with me. You can tweet at me at ISU Wildlife. Uh, you can email me there, or you can check out my website and find additional contact information there. I really appreciate your time, and, and I do look forward to at least hearing your scores uh, and uh, reporting out about the, the winners of our friendly competition. And then I also look forward to hearing uh, any feedback you have and any projects that you get going, uh, maybe applying some of this stuff. So thank you very much, and have a great day.